I'm Joel Miller. And I'm Jamie Bennett. And this is Bad Books of the Bible. It's a podcast about a collection of books with a curious pedigree and an even stranger legacy. In the last episode, we were talking about the prayers of both Tobit and Sarah. Several years ago, I was at a church in Kansas City, and I purchased a copy of the Holy Transfiguration Monastery Psalter, the little green one. And I've had that book uh, in and out of my backpack and briefcase and back pocket and whatever for a long time now. I've got several other Psalters that I've used over the years, including the Ancient Faith Psalter. And I have often resorted to the Psalms for personal prayer. Sure. But it is, uh, and that's normative for for Christians. You know, like we, we tend to think of, the Psalter as the prayer book of the church. We know that we, we think about it that way. Right. And we often think about these prayers as if they're very personal prayers. We certainly appropriate them in a personal way. Right. But that's not how they were first written. And not only is that not how they were first written, there's an interesting thing that we see in the prayers of Tobit and Sarah that show like historically in a moment, a bit of transition from an older way of thinking about prayer to a newer way. And I was just like, for instance, looking at a book on the Psalms and there's this reference to the Psalms being royal prayers. These are prayers of the King, Mm. not prayers of individuals per se. And even examples of prayers in the Old Testament that are prior to the books that we're talking about are evidence of royal prayers, like Hannah's prayer in uh, First Samuel is a very kingly prayer, sure. including at the end, you know, she speaks specifically of the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is a royal petition, even though she is making a, a prayer about her state, right? she's using a king's prayer to do it. And uh, Paul Tarazzi, the biblical scholar, talked about, you know, like an, an, a thing that we have in our culture where we take greeting cards or other things that are given to us by institutions. Like if we show up at a funeral home, there's going to be like things that we can say or do where we just attach the name of the person that we're connected to, to it, or we just sign our name and somehow we make it personal, but we're, we're appropriating somebody else's words for this very personal statement. So it's kind of like, it's an oddly uh, non-personal personal thing. And what you see instead in this prayer of, Tobit and then Sarah is taking the the mood, the language, the vibe of the Psalter of Old Testament prayer, but applying it specifically to themselves. They are appropriating the mood, the vibe, the language of the Psalter for prayers of their own. Right. And so these are authentic prayers coming from them that are self-generated. They, they, these are not cut and paste prayers. Yeah, and I, I think that it's natural with time and familiarity for that to happen. And when you consider by the time that the church came into existence as, as we know it, we inherited a scriptural treasury, which included these prayers um, that, you're, that you're speaking of, whether, whether we're talking about Hannah's prayer in Samuel or we're talking about the literal prayers of the king, King David, in the Psalms these prayers are part of a bigger inheritance yeah and in appropriating them i mean the, the church instinctively uh saw christ throughout them but they also saw saw our own struggles and our own uh challenges i think this is also natural uh for this period that we're talking about when we're talking about tobit and his circumstances because we're talking about a time that was very bad for god's people and that the Israelites, uh, many of them, um, had, had been taken away from their land. Mm-hmm. Amos 8.10 uh, prophesied, Your festivals shall be turned into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And this was a bad time. 
And yet um, the suffering of God's people, uh, the broader suffering of the people is shown in this individual story that we have here in Tobit. And one of the things that has occurred to me is that in this period, this, you know, second temple Judaism period where this, uh, where Tobit was, was written and disseminated um, in this period, there was a way of reflecting upon how to be the people of God that, that was unique, that maybe hadn't been explored uh, to the same degree before. Um, a, a lot of times in the past, it was very much about the temple and sacrifice and, mm -hmm. and, and duty, but more as, um, more as a nation. And I, I think what, what we start finding in this period when this was written is we find a lot more emphasis on the individual and that God's rewards and his punishments uh, are not meted out only on a nationalistic level, but also on an individualistic level. So like eschatology, you know, the things that starts creeping in in this period. Uh, this is when, you know, they start developing a doctrine of the resurrection and mm -hmm. things like that that really hadn't been discussed, uh, at least not in the writings uh, in Judaism prior to that. Um, so you, you almost find this sense in which the nation um, and the individual are kind of bound up together. And, and this is also, interestingly enough, the period where it starts emerging that uh, this idea of a messiah and a deliverer, and, and that becomes very deeply, uh, deeply personal. So what we see in Tobit, and one of the things I'm excited about in going through this book with you, is his, not just him, but there's personal piety yep. throughout this book, that individual holiness is stressed individual duty and responsibility to others is stressed that the one true god cared about the people of god but also cared about these particular people and their particular story tells you something about the broader group as well yeah so we have this shift or at least an expansion of what comes off maybe before as kind of a corporate or universal claim, right. national claim, uh, through the king, through the temple, like this larger top-down thing. Right. And we're seeing kind of like a bottom-up individual piety showing up here in a unique way. Yeah. Okay, so we left off with Tobit and Sarah both offering to God pretty miserable state that they're in in prayer and as you pointed out uh the prayer ascends and god's mercy descends and it descends in the form of Raphael, and we know that something big is going to happen in fact the book just spoils it it tells us what's going to happen we're we're not going to give it all away we're not going to give it all away if you really want to just like get in there and ruin it for yourself read it Actually, just kidding. You should just read it anyway. You won't ruin anything. It was written that way for a reason. Yeah. But right. we have here this little problem. We have Tobit and we have Sarah. They live in two different places. And there's a gap, a pretty big distance that needs to be bridged. How are we going to close that geographical distance? Um, we, need, we need a MacGuffin, right, to move the story <laughs> forward. And like a lot of great stories, the MacGuffin is money. So if you jump back to chapter one, you'll find uh, a very interesting little plot point that we left out in our conversation because we knew we were saving it for this juicy moment right here. That's right. And that is that Tobit was Shalmaneser's agent. And, you know, basically he's buying and selling for the royal, uh, for the court. And in that he's been prosperous. We've talked about that. Well, he had 10 talents of silver that he left in Medea. The problem is that during Sennacherib's reign, the roads were unsafe, so he never went back for it. Right. And if you recall, well, I'll get to that in a second, but let's talk about how much money we're talking about here. Roughly, I mean, this is very back of the napkin calculations here, but, you know, like a drachma is basically one day's worth of manual labor, a drachma, and a talent of silver is worth about 6,000 drachma. So, you know, like, the upshot is they're rich. They just got to go get it. Right. You know, they got to go get the money. Right. 
now that Sennacherib's gone, the roads seem to be safer. It's time to go retrieve the cash. And again, like a lot of things, uh, the MacGuffin is money, but now there's another one too. And that is <laughs> Tobit prayed to die, which means yeah. he expects to like expire pretty quick. So he's got to get, he's got to set up his family. He's got to take care of his family. And the way he's going to do it is he's going to send Tobias to get the money. Tobit actually says, now that I have asked for death, why do I not call my son Tobias and explain to him about the money before I die? Like, right. I don't got a lot of time left. I got to do this. He definitely believed in the power yeah. of prayer. <laughs> he sure did. He sure did. And it was like, not even about something positive. You right. know, I mean, he's like, I asked God in all honesty to knock me off and I expect it to happen. Expect it any day now. <laughs> but we, we got to wrap so, this up with a testament, you know, tie up some loose ends, make sure our kids are taken care of. Well, okay. So that's exactly it. He doesn't tell him about the money first off. He calls Tobit in. Right. And he instead, he kind of gives his farewell address. This is like the fatherly send off. Sure. He's expecting this to be it. Right. Yeah. Um, so he says, you know, first off, I want you to bury me. Obviously, death is top of mind. First thing he talks about is right. he wants you to bury him, uh, wants you to bury me. He says he wants uh, him to honor his mother. Don't grieve her. When she finally kicks the bucket, bury her next to me. And then he offers an awful lot of uh, advice for life that is very wisdom oriented. This is going to echo the book of Proverbs. This is going to echo other wisdom literature in the Bible, like another bad book of the Bible we'll be covering soon, Yeah, the wisdom of Sirach. This echoes a lot of that same wisdom literature. And, you know, we'll come back to that in some way or another at some point, but let's just talk about some of the things he specifically says. He says that he should revere the Lord and not violate the law. He talks about um, doing things that are in accordance with the law and with, in accordance with truth and that it will prosper in their activities. In other words, God will bless, the, bless you for keeping the law. He will bless you for acting in accordance with the truth, which is super ironic because, you know, Tobit is literally living yeah. in the yeah. opposite of that right now. You know, he's lived honorably right. and his life has gone completely sideways. And I, I think it's interesting that he's, um, you know, he's so interested in a lot of these these things that he exemplified in his own life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's telling his son to bury him and he buried people. He's telling his son to give alms and he gave alms. That was at the top of his list. Yep. Um, yep. You know, o over and over, he is passing on the things. Yeah. He's trying to pass on the things that are most important to him. Yeah. And that made his life. Move. I read somewhere that uh, the book of Tobit is like a dramatization of the teaching of Deuteronomy. Mm. And Tobit exemplifies, you know, the law. He yeah. exemplifies what piety looks like. And he is now handing off that example to Tobit or to Tobias, his son. Right. You know, you mentioned almsgiving. He specifically says, for instance, some pretty strong words like almsgiving delivers from death, which is a, a surprising statement. And, right. you know, in the Orthodox tradition, there's an awful lot of emphasis on almsgiving, especially around times of, you know, fasting around ascetical periods. It's not focused on heavily in other traditions that I have been around or heard, but it is clearly underscored, underlined, emphasized, asterisks, front and back, you know, ugly highlighter all over this, yeah. that almsgiving is really, really essential. Right. And I just wanted to quote one line um, from this. This is uh, chapter four, verse seven. Tobit says, give alms from your possessions to all who practice justice. Do not turn your face away from any poor person. And the reason that stands out to me, aside from what we've just talked about, is it's picked up or echoed by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter five, like almost exactly the same phrasing. Mm -hmm. Give to the one who asks from you and do not turn away from a person who wishes to borrow from you. This is now Jesus's statement is a little bit more universal. Yeah. He doesn't uh, limit it to those who practice justice, for instance. It's it's just assumed like Jesus, you know, has he's like Biggie sizes all the commandments in a sense. 
<laughs> he's kind of biggie size this it, it's universal right but this is in the ethos this is a this is a, a a line or a text or or at least a teaching that christ himself is obviously intimately familiar with yeah and so many of the um, early church fathers in their comments on this uh they point right to this text about almsgiving delivering from death mm-hmm. uh to them it uh, like saint ambrose for example seems to take it for granted like like this is obviously true yeah that this helps our soul saint, saint augustine uh similarly he, uh actually got a quote here from him he said the son held out his hand to his father to enable him to walk on earth because remember tobit's blind here yeah and the father to the son to enable him to dwell in heaven and I and I loved this beautiful parallel uh, where where we're talking about this fatherly advice being passed on. But but why 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 is he saying this? Because he cares about his son and he cares that his son will live righteously. But also, mm-hmm. as it says, for alms giving delivers from death. Like he wants something greater than just in this yeah. earth for his son as well. Yeah, the wisdom that transcends this uh, this life. This wisdom also, of course, applies to this life and. One of the ways it applies to this to this life is marriage, and so he yeah. sp- he talks about the sexual ethics of of the world, and he specifically says to yep. stay away from fornication and marry a nice Jewish girl. Like right. he's <laughs> he wants he wants his son to keep it in the clan to stay yeah. among his kinspeople, and he right. he mentions the the witness of the patriarchs. To show this so he talks about do like abraham did do like isaac did do like jacob did but interestingly he also says do like noah did mm. now you can read genesis top to bottom and you'll never find any reference to noah marrying within his kins people you will however find it in another book that we don't have plans to cover at this point um the book of jubilees which very specifically refers to Noah marrying a relation. And so there is in in chapter four of the book of Jubilees, it specifically mentions that. So in this period, uh, these folks are reading, like the author of Tobit is reading a book like uh, Jubilees, or it's just in the air, and he happens to know it. And so it's included here. Um, But I found that interesting. It's like an intertextual kind of connection to another book uh, that is also an intriguing, an intriguing read. That, that is really cool. And I, I, I think it's important for us to underscore uh, the point that this would have been to, to the Israelites, right? The, this idea of identity as a body of people was very important to them from circumcision um, on. Like it, there, there were markers that made them the Hebrews, that made them God's people. Yep. Um, this would have been really really important also when you consider being in exile yep you know he's he's long gone from their homeland from the promised land that was given to his forefathers yeah and so living in exile one of the things that i think has made jewish people so distinct over the years is this idea that despite wherever we are scattered they maintain the markers of jewishness and, yep. and while that looks a little different today uh, than it would have in Tobit's time, nonetheless, he was living in exile, maintained his identity uh, as part of the people of Israel, and was passing that on to his son. Yeah. Avoiding fornication probably means more than just our, our sexual ethic that we're talking about. It also probably has to do with intermarrying. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that would have been considered a great transgression uh, to marry outside of the, the people of God. Now, of course, there there are avenues for conversion and things like that, but I, I'm not sure that that was at the forefront of their mind um, at this time. But all all of this uh, really comes down to identity markers of what makes a faithful yeah. Hebrew, which we know from the whole book to this point mm-hmm. really matters yeah. to Tobit. You know, like of all the things in the world to care about, these yeah. are on the top of his list. There's more advice that he gives. So there's, you know, like, it, again, this this echoes Proverbs, this echoes Sirach, this echoes other wisdom literature in the Bible to love uh, your family, love your kindred, mm-hmm. um, that rejecting 
his people would be a kind of pride that would be ruinous. Yeah. Um, he talks about in idleness, there's loss and poverty. So don't be idle. Right. He also tells him to not hold out on his employees. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he wants him to be honorable in his, in his dealings. Right. And this is going to come up by the way, because I don't know if we'll yeah. draw the line exactly, but sure. um, they're getting ready to hire somebody. And there's going to be a payoff for that guy. So like, here's a great little moment in the story. That's kind of teasing another element in the story to come. And then he says something else that's super interesting. He says, what you hate, do not do to anyone. Mm. And this in, in the research I've done so far uh, seems to be the earliest statement in the West if we can call it the West, I guess the earliest statement in the Western tradition, that is essentially the golden rule, but flipped. That is the, a negative statement of the golden rule. So not do unto others as you would have them do it to you, but rather do not do to others as you would not have done to yourself. Yeah. This is uh, the contemporary writer, Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb refers to this as the silver rule. (laughs) And I, I, I've, I've always been fascinated by the way he, he mentions this. This is in uh, his book, Skin in the Game. Yeah. But he talks about this is even being, in a sense, more robust than the golden rule. I don't know that I go that far. But what he's trying to say is that there's something really powerful in just inverting that. Yeah. Because you know what you don't want to happen to you. Yeah. Well, you, like, you better think twice about ever doing that to somebody else. St. Gregory the, the Great said in comparing these two, uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and call Tobit's rule here, the silver rule. So uh, I'm just going to run with it. So <laughs> in comparing the golden rule and the sil- silver rule, uh, St. Gregory the Great said, by which two precepts of both testaments, by the one an evil disposition is restrained, and by the other a good dis- disposition is charged upon us. So it's coming at the at it from two different angles. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. one one is restraining us from certain conduct and the other is calling us uh, to a form of conduct or, or a disposition toward our neighbor. Yeah. And John, John Chrysostom uh, has a beautiful passage. Um, I'd love to share part of it. Uh, in a fuller form, it was pretty great. But yeah. it says, do you wish to receive kindness? Be kind to another. Do you wish to receive mercy? Show mercy to your neighbor. Do you wish to be applauded? applaud another do you wish to be loved exercise love and 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 he was actually commenting on on this text so uh in in that passage i believe so what you really see is there's a positive side and and a negative side um and i think you could you can argue that you get both out of the same thing yeah um there's there's positive duties um and there's things to be avoided if we're truly to love our neighbor this brings up what is kind of in the background of this book all along, which is what does it look like to be a faithful believer mm-hmm. in a world in which you are not wholly welcome, in a world in which you are an alien? This attempt to think about the other in a way that honors them, or at least refrains from dishonoring them, is really essential. Yeah. This reminds me of the letter to Diognetus, which is an early Christian letter. Uh, And in that letter, there's a really interesting point made about the role of a Christian in in this society that is not Christian, the role of this, uh, of a believer in a society that doesn't believe like they do. He says that the Christian is in the world like the soul is in the body, that the Christian is in the world like the animating force And that animating force is love. And he talks about the ways in which Christians are different, but it is in their difference. It is in the way that they honor that difference and then honor their neighbor that they elevate the whole society. And Tobit's advice to his son is guaranteed to help elevate not only his position in his own community, but the position of other faithful believers, even outside of their community. If a Christian, if a faithful believer or a Christian in in the context that we're talking now, demonstrates the golden rule, demonstrates the silver rule, 
they will elevate their whole community because they will be yeah. walking around with an ethic that honors others. And, and that's a beautiful thing to think about and contemplate. And Tobit has now given us in this passage, another slice on that. He's given us another angle, another, another lens on that truth. Yeah, that's, that's true. And, and that's important for, for Tobit even later. I, I don't want to give a spoiler or anything, but you know, toward the end of the book, he has great hope for the future conversion of the Gentile nations, that they would turn mm -hmm. to Israel's God and honor Israel's God, um, honor the one true God, perhaps is another way to say it. Um, and so I, I think that's important to him, um, even in this, in this prayer. I mean, part of what he's encouraged, I'm sorry, not prayer, admonition. Yeah. Even part of what he's, he's giving here to his son, he, he talks about, posterity inheriting the land yeah it's so it's a vision that that is very very earthy uh literally and in the recognition that they are dwelling among the nations yes yeah. and that view that vision of the future in which the nations are coming to the god of israel won't happen if you're a jackass it won't happen <laughs> if you're a jerk to those people yeah. you know yeah. tobit says uh remember these commandments to his son he says, at all times, bless the Lord God, remember these commandments. Uh, I was reading in St. Cyprian of Carthage. He, he was commenting on this, uh, where he was actually warning parents. He was speaking, you know, right to parents, warning them against failing to pass on the faith, failing to impress upon how important a love for Christ is. And the earthly things can be a distraction, right? And, and it and it wasn't even that St. Cyprian was saying that they shouldn't care about earthly things. As a father, they certain fathers and, and mothers certainly have a responsibility um, in that regard with their children. But St. Cyprian was saying we should also teach them to love Christ above all that is earthly. And so he, he gives an exhortation. He says, be such a father to your children as was Tobit. Give useful and saving precepts to your pledges, such as he gave to his son, saying, and now, my son, I command you serve God in truth. Amen. That's awesome. So he does talk about I, I, bringing up money, by the way, sounds so crass after that statement, but we have to do it <laughs> because that's what moves the story forward. Yes, and yes. as another great wisdom book tells us, the book of Ecclesiastes, money answereth all things. So Let's get back to the cash. Basically, Tobit tells Tobias yeah. all about the money, that it's in Medea, which uh, we've already talked about. That's, you know, Sarah lives in Ecbatana, which is in Medea. This money is in Rajas or Rages or something. I don't even know. It's, it's an R, it's an A, <laughs> it's a G, it's an E, it's an S, Rajas, in Medea. So these are like neighboring areas. Yeah. And right. And now it's time. He's going to send him out to go get it. The roads are clear. It's going to be fine. It's it's, yeah. it's maybe going to be tricky. We'll get to that in just a second. But he is going to send Toba. He says, so now, my son, find yourself a trustworthy man to go with you and we will pay him wages until you return. But get back the money. And you may recall, again, that's where Sarah lives in Medea. This is where our two storylines converge. I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. And you've been listening to Bad Books of the Bible. A production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next week when we find out what the heck's going on with Raphael. <laughs>